Hi, I'm Penny Resnick. And I'm Jamie Dobson, and I'm also happy to be here today on the Agile Uprising podcast. Greetings and welcome to another edition of the Agile Uprising podcast. I'm your host again. You're stuck with me again, Jay Hersko. And the topic of this episode is uh, one I've been waiting to get to for quite a while. Uh, luckily, the stars aligned and I was able to get these folks on the phone. We're going to be discussing the O'Reilly book, Cloud Native Transformation, Practical Patterns for Innovation. And we are blessed and lucky to have two of the authors of this book on the recording with me. So first, I have Penny Resnick. Penny, thank you for joining. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And I also have co-author Jamie Dobson. Jamie, thank you to Zoe as well. My pleasure. Glad to be here. Thank you. I, I, I can't express, uh, and I was showing pictures of how many flags, I got to put some in the show notes, flags and notes and stuff I've actually taken in this book. Um, I would love to fire it via bazooka at people and just tell them to read it. Uh, but before we go into uh, me uh, generously praising the book, let's start with, guys, why a book? Why now? Why this topic? Where, where did that come from? I think the general idea of the book is, uh, and why now? It's because we are we're running a company that actually helps other businesses to move to cloud native. And there's a lot of misunderstanding what cloud native is. And one of our biggest challenges is to actually tell people that, you know, cloud native is not just technology. It's not just a bunch of tools, but uh, it's a lot more, it's more cultural change. And um, after telling this story so many times to customers or potential customers and friends and, uh, and others, it's just we had enough content to actually write a book about it. And of course, the thing about patterns is they bridge the so-called experts, which in this case is us, with the, well, I wouldn't say laymen or laywomen per se, but people who have not been exposed to cloud native transformation. And the idea is that patterns, exactly like Christopher Alexander, Alexander's original design patterns, help people to understand the context in which they're working. And I, I mean, my, I personally, I like the approach of a pattern versus the trite and true framework, right? Because with a pattern, you're really saying, here's the, here's the synopsis. And we'll get into this in a minute, you know, here's what it is. Here's what you want to do. Here's what you want to look out for. Whereas a framework, it automatically puts people into that predefined mental model of, okay, if I follow all these steps, I'll be successful completely regardless of the current environment, the culture, what have you. And then we know that's where things go. That's where things start to get goofy. Um, so uh, I, first, uh, I just want to give an intro with the, my exposure with the book. I saw this book pop up on Amazon. And again, I've never written code. So I'm one of uh, the listeners is wonderful hearing this. I have never written a line of code in my life. So I'm looking at cloud native transformations. I'm going, oh shit, is this going to be over my head? And then I saw it was 500 pages and I'm like, and it's an O'Reilly book, right? So you know, it's going to be in the weeds. And I'm going, oh man, I hope I don't buy this thing. And I just stare at it and go, uh, I need I need help trying to understand it. Like shout out to Mark Burgess and his Promise Theory stuff. I actually enlisted help to get through those books. Um, but I bought this book and I and I picked it up and I started reading it on a Saturday and I think I spent an entire weekend outside just reading and highlighting and and, and blasting through it. Right. Um, I think there's there's a lot to be gained here, even for um, to steal what Jamie's. It's not necessarily the layman, laywoman, layperson, but if you're anywhere involved in technology in the enterprise or even even in a small company. This is where the world is going. It makes sense to let's get on the train, right? Um, the first one of the first quotes that jumped out at me, um, it was a back to back of when you started defining what cloud native actually means. Um, you know, we started before we were recording. We were talking about the idea of a cloud. People think of this of it as like this amorphous, you know, fake entity up in the sky where we just throw code up there and it just miraculously works. Um, there's there's a there's two quotes in here that I picked out that I thought were were really insightful. The first one was, "It's not about the servers, but the services," and that dovetailed right into, "It's not it's it's about how we create and deliver, not where." And I think that's a very very big statement that people need to be aware of, right? It, it just, you know, these, um, these practices, these patterns that you, that, you, that you suggest, you don't have to do it in AWS. These are, so, some of these are just common sense, right? Penny, you've got to take this one. This was yours. <laughs> Serv- service, but, and services, not how, but where, this is yours. You've got to take this uh, one. I, I'm going to take I, the one on strategy and options. <laughs> okay. Um, 
of course it's not about technology and and that that's the biggest challenge the biggest challenge for people is to think that they think that they just buy a tool kubernetes or something they can just hire somebody to install it and then they're good to go but in reality it's not it's not the same uh, speed of change the world is changing much faster the innovation is going now not every 10 20 30 years the dramatic disruptive change is happening now every two three four years what it means is that if you dedicate two years to to change from old way of doing things into new way of doing things then you will always be in the process of change so you mm -hmm. need to integrate the change as part of your normal work and for that uh it's not about specific cloud. Like in the first two years, we met people who moved to Mesos, for example, and then three years later, they were moving to Kubernetes and they still hiring external people to help them, which makes no sense, right? What people need to learn is how to do the change itself. Doesn't matter what it is. And the patterns are all about actually uh, helping people to figure out the process of change rather than adoption of a specific tool. And to follow on from what Pinny said there, Mesos, Kubernetes, these are accidental properties of cloud native. They're not wholly relevant. Mm. So at, at the heart of this is a culture, it's a way of being. Abraham Maslow, the psychologist, used to talk about this. So you can put an all black rugby union kit on anybody in the street. That doesn't make them a professional <laughs> rugby player. And you can give any company in the world <laughs> Kubernetes, AWS, uh, and Elastic uh, on demand. It will not make them cloud native. It will not magically make them experimental, which is at the absolute heart of cloud native. Um, and so Pinny's right. The, these technologies are really, not only are they not part of the story, they're a distraction. And you you both touched on the, the culture piece of it, right? Which we'll get to in a minute where, um, you have these, a lot of times you have these large companies grasping for, grasping to retain their relevance, their market share, and they see the bright and shiny Kubernetes monster. Oh, let's use Kubernetes, like you said, at AWS and A3, and then they start doing things and then um, it doesn't work. And they're like, oh, well, this is just a fad. We're going to go away from it where it's, it's completely, yeah, you missed the forest for the trees. You completely missed the forest for the trees. Um, speaking of forest for the trees, um, again, as a non-developer, as someone who's only written HTML code probably close to a decade ago, uh, the diagram that you laid out uh, on page nine for me, I have this, I have literally copied this and sent this to almost every intern I work with at my current job. And I said, you want to understand cloud architecture? Here it is in a nutshell, right? And Dave Snowden talks all about the four quadrant diagram and how that says humans, that's how we remember things because it's just easiest. You know, you have, you have infrastructure and platforms as a service. You have containerization. There's automation, orchestration, and sitting right in the middle is microservices. Um, I, I, I honestly, I, I, I can't, I'm, I feel like a fanboy. I'm probably embarrassing myself, but I can't, I can't say this enough how much I've sent this to people and say, look, you know, what is cloud? Well, here's it is. Here's what it is in a nutshell. Um, where, did, um, where did this kind of idea come from? Were you just kind of knocking stuff around and say, well, at its, at its almost kernel, at its genetic code, this is what it comes down to. Where did that, how did that come about? Actually, the source of this diagram, or the, the origin of this diagram, coming from CNCF, the Cloud Native Compute Foundation, and their definition of cloud native, which is actually can be summarized as containers, orchestration, and microservices. Right? We're expanding it to also a public cloud or IS pass, um, and of course automation because that's missing. Later on, we also expand it to more cultural and other aspects of the of the story. But on the technical level. This is actually, there is quite strong agreement in industry that this is what you actually need as mm. tool set. And orchestration, of course, currently is led by Kubernetes. That's the, the tool that is doing where it is doing. But the thing is that if you do orchestration and containers, but you don't use microservices, you are missing out, mm -hmm. right? This, this holistic approach to actually doing all of those elements is as important as each of the elements. I think the original definition of from the Cloud Native Compute Foundation was so good. I've, I think I can almost recite it from memory. And it was something along the lines of a Cloud Native architecture is microservice orientated, or was it something like mic, could, microservice and container orientated to make the most out of public cloud infrastructure. And I think people get confused. They think stuff's on a cloud and therefore it's Cloud Native. That's not what this is about. 
the orchestration and the containerization element is about packing virtual machines to keep your costs low on the public cloud. Hmm. Automation lets your lets you redeploy your application, make changes and redeploy it quickly so that your system grows at the same pace as your users' needs. This is why Netflix currently has a brand new feature that says, pick me a movie at random. This has arisen <laughs> out of COVID. People can't, they can't, don't know what to mm -hmm. decide. So they add a new feature, they deploy it quickly, and voila, there's a change for real users over here in Greenwich, London, where I lived. So there are many, many good practices and automation pops up in all different places. Uh, and, of, and of course, so does orchestration. But these five ideas together let you build and evolve digital products to run that large scale on top of public cloud infrastructure. As far as architecture is concerned, I think we think that's the end of the discussion. And it's a shame that the CNCF changed the definition. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I would agree. Like, and, and for my, my layman, right, I would agree that I've had a couple of conversations with people where I broke it down to this point and they kind of went, Jay, are you sure you're not writing code on the back end? I'm like, no, nah, man, I, no, I don't, I don't go anywhere near that. I'm just a glorified podcast host. Um, but I, I, I love how the the simplicity, almost elegance, right, of how it's laid out. And you know, you you we keep we keep going back to the elephant in the room, right? And the elephant is culture, right? Um, that you can't just. Uh, there's a quote here: if you simply layer the latest tech, uh, page 15. If you simply layer the latest tech on top of the same old way you've always done things, you're going to create a whole new slew of problems. And I think that is a that is an um, explicit acknowledgement that you know we talked about earlier how leaders need to make like if I'm just going to spackle this spread like peanut butter right um, well we're going to go to the cloud on top of our current existing sand that we're built on things don't go well in my in my life I have seen uh, in my in my corporate roles um, I've seen a lot of organizations try to do a transformation where they just want to layer safe on top of everything and not acknowledge the cultural and the leadership and the incentivization changes, the people changes that need to be done to match. And when you have that, it's completely incongruous. The pieces don't fit. It's like a bad Ikea instruction set. And then the bookcase falls apart, right? If I'm going to really, really mix metaphors. Um, what, one of the things that you, you, you talk about early in the book that I thought was really fascinating is, um, and you, you come back to it a couple of times, why cloud native, why cloud transformations go wrong? And I actually had an experience in a previous job where when you gave the example of you're going to try and do it once, you're going to try and do it in a small uh, part of your org, it's going to work, you're going to say this is great, you're going to try and blow it up and it's going to fail. And then you're going to bring in a different vendor and you're going to try and blow it up again and then it's going to fail again. And I'm reading this book and I'm, I'm literally like staring off in this face like, I mean, imagine, somebody's imagine, in my head, somebody's in my head. <laughs> imagine bring imagine bringing what you've just described is, is something like this imagine bringing a tradesman to your house to give you a new kitchen and it doesn't work your family doesn't become instantly happy the food coming out of the kitchen is no better so you bring the third tradesman and the fourth tradesman and in the space of half a decade you have five kitchens when really what you needed to do was take marriage counseling <laughs> this is how this is how crazy what you're talking about is bringing in a set of technologies and installing something in the corner of your house like a new kitchen and a microwave and hoping that will change your family dynamic is absolutely insane. Right, and right. Ultimately, but who's driving that? Who's driving that? People who sell tools or in my example, people who sell kitchens. Right, <laughs> right, right. KitchenAid, yeah. But, but it's, also, it's also, we cannot ignore the, the fact that everyone, like who is currently senior management, um, mid to senior management in large enterprises? People our age, right? 40s, 50s, 60s. They were studying 20, 30 years ago, right? The way they studied was prepare a really good plan, execute. By the end of it, you have an amazing kitchen, right? Mm -hmm. I just cannot afford that anymore. It's just not mm -hmm. happening. You need to go for quickly through that. And these tools, like when, when you say, I need two years plan to lay out the Kubernetes setup, this makes no sense in today's world. Right. Right. I mean, tech, the technology, uh, not even just technology, right? Let's take it a step further. Life moves so fast now. We yes. are all globally interconnected. You know, we were, before we started recording, um, we were discussing American geopolitics, right? We are globally connected. You know, 40, 50 years ago, you might have gotten a story about some riots in the States, but you might have gotten it a week later, and it might have been of questionable veracity, right? Life is moving too fast now. So we, to your point, Penny, we can't afford the the old way of scientific management, I build this plan, it takes 48 exactly. months and we have to just bury our head in sand and go. There's, there is a paradox, of course, in here. Um, 
the needs of people are changing. So 2001 or 2000, you know, 20, whew, how many years ago is that? 21 years ago. By the mm. way, did you realize it's the 21st day of the 21st year of the 21st century? Yeah, it's kind of, kind of, nuts. <laughs> kind of nuts. Kind of nuts. <laughs> well, in that 21 years, in those 21 years, when I, when Penny and I both started work, we were happy to have a salary and actually couldn't believe we were being paid to program computers, which is what <laughs> we did for fun. But nevertheless, the idea of getting extra coaching, unlimited book budgets, and actually enjoying ourselves at work, even 20 years ago, was absolutely unheard of. But the needs... Uh, and the expectations of young professionals have changed. We now want psychologically safe workplaces. We want to innovate. And on the other side of the coin, the needs of users have changed. All of those young people who were brought up with Amazon and Netflix and WhatsApp, they expect their bank and their city council to provide them the same level of service that they get from these amazing digital products. Mm -hmm. And herein lies a very interesting problem the people who build those products are all psychologically hugely mature, very creative and hardworking. And if banks and the post office and the local council is to match Netflix and Google, they've got to have an equally innovative workforce. So we choose the tools because we think they're easy. But actually, these products, this way of working and way of being is really a whole system of innovation. And how do you scale that globally? Right. I think, right. They, I think yeah. yeah, maybe that's what and the book's about. And to add to that, I have teenage kids, right? And they study in school. Um, they have all these new tools, uh, cloud tools, computers. They all use computers. They have to use computer in the school. But the studies are, are the same. Right? It's still boring. It's still class setting. There's still a one teacher speaks to 30 kids or whatever number of kids in the class. And it's the same, same content when I was studying. On the other hand, my son is playing on Sony PlayStation, right? And, and it's amazing how, how attractive it is for them. So how much budget, how much investment goes into education and still how little mm -hmm. it became interesting, right? And mm -hmm. exciting and how little it attracts the kids and encourages them to study, right? And this is the type of uh, lack of innovation that is uh, very, like everywhere in enterprise world. And in, in, on the other hand, these new banks like Starlink Bank or all kind of these innovative companies, they are providing these exciting new changes all the time, every day. And to Jamie's point, right? Like I look at my bank and then I look at the example you actually have in the book about the bank that doesn't even have a brick and mortar, right? Because if you think about yeah. it, what, is, what does my bank do for me? I deposit my check. I pay my bills. I go shopping. It's all via debit, very little via cash. I don't need a brick and mortar. Right. So and, and the response time is there. The the web app, the web UI is is navigable. It's friendly. It's something I can use. It's there's all sorts of stuff about generational, the generational divide, the technology divide. I mean, there's an old saying, there's an old joke that um science itself, science advances one dead body at a time. So if Jamie has spent his whole life saying the, you know, the earth is the center of the universe, right? And he is in a position where that he's made his thesis and his entire career out of it, right? He's not going to change his mind. And part of that is a human yeah. thing, but it's also that's what he's made his bones with. And then when Jamie dies and Penny sitting behind him going, this guy was crazy, right? The sun is the center of the earth. At this point, right. you know, those the gatekeeping, right? That gatekeeper is gone and it's open for new ideas. And I think part of the things you talk about in the book with culture, right, is you need to question that old mindset, that old gatekeeping mentality of, well, this is the way we've always done that, things. We need absolutely. to be open-minded. That has to change. Uh, I think this is the biggest problem that we are describing in the book is that this generational change, you have to change the generation to bring the change. It's impossible to maintain anymore because the change needs to be every three years. You cannot so wait is... until the manager <laughs> retires. You have to change now. What you're talking about is the so-called nemesis effect. So apparently, I, I'm not sure how old everybody is on the podcast right now, but when I was a kid, we were taught that dinosaurs all died because of a meteorite. Now, only 20 years earlier, that theory was, was discredited and not held in, in, in the mainstream. Now, what was the change that happened in the 20 years before my birth that changed popular belief? Well, the old scientists who pioneered the early belief, they all died. This is the nemesis effect. And this was how a shift in belief happened. But I honestly don't think that will change things in cloud native. Um, so I've been working on a new, we, we, I don't know if you know, but we've got a new um, 
initiative that Consider Sculptures. It's called WTF Cloud Native. What the fuck is Cloud Native? <laughs> now, considering we wrote a book about this, you think we might have the answer. <laughs> now, part of the answer, well, we don't have the answer, by the way. You've got to subscribe to find out. But, but and, and even then, you won't find out. Um, now, so I was studying uh, Andy Grove. He was the inter. He was the COO of Intel. He was the first employee there, actually, after the two founders. He was born in Budapest, so uh, he was an immigrant to the United States. He had first avoided uh, the death camps from Hitler, and then he avoided uh, uh, Stalinist Hungary when they took over thereafter. And he was one of a couple of hundred thousand uh, people who had escaped, young people who had escaped Hungary and arrived eventually in Silicon Valley. This type of formative experience creates leaders. So exactly what Pinny said earlier, his son has been taught the same old stuff mm. that we were taught, Entrepreneurs and leaders are forged in the fires of extremely difficult circumstances. And the problem is, if we have got a very run-of-the-mill education system, where is the next Grove coming from? And where is the next Hastings coming from, the CEO uh, and other mm -hmm. founder of Netflix? Mm -hmm. This is an issue. Now, we're pretty entrepreneurial. We've also not had the most straightforward <laughs> uh, journeys in our life so far. But how do you take something that's bequeathed by trauma, essentially leadership, and then scale that because ultimately leadership and crowd native go together uh, and leadership qualities and behavior is actually very far, few and far between. And I think to your point, Jamie, um, building on that point of, you know, um, forged in the fires of adversity, right? If you look at some of our most successful CEOs, some people who have um, come up with new ideas, right? If you look at Steve Jobs and you look at his resume, whether you love him or hate him, right? You know, the jury's still out, right? But if you look at his life experience leading up to what he did at Apple, he took a callig calligraphy class which influenced how he viewed the design of the phones. He was a failed, you know, uh, startup guy. So he kind of learned how to structure a business, right? He had all these different varied experiences, um, which lead to a, not only a more, I, I would argue more fruitful life, but you come away with a different uh, appreciation and assessment, a different way of looking at things. And a lot, of the, a lot of the stuff you talk about in the book is it really is truly just a new way of looking at things. And, and I'm, I love how you brought up the nemesis effect, right? Because um, for our listeners, there's a giant chunk of the book which talks about actual behavior, behavior, biases, nudges, um, which I actually refer to this book when I'm not even doing work stuff, when I'm trying to do other things, because I'm like, I know I saw that bias somewhere. And I use, I use your cloud native book as a reference on unconscious and conscious bias. So, uh, you know, uh, budding psychology minors out there, you pick this book up, it's a, it's a great cheat sheet. Um, but I thought that was um, an interesting, but very well-deserved inclusion, because like you said, Benny, you know, we have, it's a new generation of, of um, people who are used to a different way of working, and we need to be uh, cognizant of some of the roadblocks we're going to run into with dealing with people who may not be aware of the whole idea of unconscious bias, may not be aware of, you know, the whole uh, ad hominem attack where I come into you with a new idea and you're just yelling me about budget, right? That's a whole different piece that we, as humans, as just good humans, we need to be cognizant of. Oh. So as a consultant, you learn that all the problems are human problems. <laughs> it's, uh, you rarely deal with technology problems because they're easy uh -huh. to solve. <laughs> and the human problems are not when people know what needs to be done and you know, it's it's like it's very actually it it's difficult to find a problem that people are not aware of entirely, right? So it's like you come to a person and say you need to move to cloud. They say, yeah, of course I know it, and I know it for five years now, and I'm still not there. How how do you, do you help me mm. actually do it and not? That is related to the uh, to the biases, to all kind of status quo biases, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, you, and confirmation biases, and all kind of biases that just block people from taking the actions and seeing the the world the way it actually is, not the way they want it to be. And instead, they continue planning, they continue investing in tools, they continue doing other things because that's what they have been doing in the past. Right. And you see through the lens of bias. Cloud data transformation is connected to those who can keep on top of the bias, which is another word for emotionally and psychologically mature people. Mm -hmm. There is a link. I can tell you something funny about biases as well. Since we wrote a book on it, you could say we're somewhat experts, but this doesn't stop us falling prey to biases either, including negative attribution bias. So this is interesting when um, 
working together with, with Pini, where you're as liable to fall into biases as even if you know about them. And, uh, mm -hmm. Maybe there's a bias. Is there a bias for that, Pini? I think yeah, there is. I, I vaguely there's, remember there is one. Yeah. There's bias for everything. It's, <laughs> every human behavior is. And, and the, the good thing with bias is that most of the time, they're actually good behaviors that are beneficial for us. That's why they exist. But there are these sort of circumstances that they, you need to recognize that that's where we are really susceptible to, to doing something wrong. Yeah. And it's very difficult to see yourself from outside, right? So you have to have an advice, external advice, to sort of observe you and, uh, and point those biases out when, uh, when you're behaving in the wrong way. I, uh, some of our, go on, Jamie, go on. I was going to say some of our, our more recent research points to, we call it the Norman Dixon paradox. So this was, this was a guy, Norman Dixon was a psychologist, and he wrote a book in 1976. And he, basically he said this, the type of person who's attracted to the military is somebody who likes order and regimentation which is exactly the wrong type of person to fight on the battlefield. So the military naturally attracts people who would be no good at mm -hmm. the military's ultimate aim, which is to win battles. It's the same with enterprises. They, they, they attract ordered people, people who don't like chaos. Uh, and yet this is exactly what cloud native is. It's a type of organized chaos. But there's something worse or there's something more to add to that normal people, so people who are not necessarily ordered, just sort of middle of the road people, not too chaotic, not too ordered, when placed under stress, they become more ordered and they seek safety. So if you're a company with an existential threat because of your competitors or because Amazon's decided to play in your backyard, the last thing you, the, and, and cloud native is the thing that can help you escape from that and help you compete, all of a sudden the stress causes you to be more ordered and more anal if you were than normal, which of course, destroys your reaction, mm -hmm. kills your creative thinking. It ends up being a, a self-defeating prophecy where you kind of just recursively spiral downwards, right? You, you, you look for more, so you apply more. It's the same thing where um, you have a project that's run in a traditional manner that gets a little bit loose, right? It gets a little bit out of control. So you put more process controls in place to prevent that from happening. And then by adding more overhead and more process controls, you tightly constrain the system. So things get even worse. And then you add more constraints that get its worse. You add more constraints. And then you eventually you end up with the equivalency of a corporate policy where you can't order anything more than a stack of post-its without getting approval from 17 people in, 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 uh, in um, the hardware, software, desktop support. Right. And to, an and to an external person, it appears to be stupid and self-defeating, mm -hmm. but it's actually the psychological effects of stress. Right. And uh, all this eff effects are very well described in the book, Medical Men Month by Fred Brooks in 70s. All of those questions are the answer. There's things like uh, adding people to late project makes it later. Yep. Ninth, women cannot make a child in a month, right? And all kinds of other things, right? It's, uh, it's just there, there are limitations of human behavior and you cannot, you, if you put more pressure you don't automatically get better results. If you had more people, you don't automatically get better results. Right, right. Too much pressure does not automatically turn the coal into a diamond. You may just get a highly compacted, fragmented piece of coal. Right. And the innovation has to have certain level of chaos, right? There is a saying in one of the book I, I read recently, innovation leaves on the edge of chaos. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Because if you create too much structure, there is no innovation in such environment. On the other hand, if there is no structure at all, if there is total chaos, there are no practical deliverables, there is no value delivered, there is just creativity, which is art. And art is, is great, but it's not practical. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah. go on, Jamie. I was going to say, since innovation lives on the edge of chaos, that's where innovative teams have to live. Uh, and, it's, and if you're there all the time, it's, it's, you, you end up looking like me. <laughs> Tired. Bags under your eyes. <laughs> yeah, but I would say that's a good problem to have. But but to the point about innovation happening at the chaos, right? And chaos, we know that um, innovation always happens at the edges, right? It's never centrally yeah. driven. And I think part of the, you know, back to human bias and psychology and whatnot, you know, people want to boil things down to a false dichotomy and then pick A or B, right? And this is our this is our mammal brain sitting on top of our lizard brain. Have you ever read any of that stuff about the triune brain theory? Um, it, it and it's all about calorie saving, right? 
I, I need to hunt the next mammoth. I want to make decisions with the minimum amount of calorie expansion possible. So I'm going to boil it down to an A or B. I'm going to pick A and I'm going to go. Um, whereas you need that chaos, you need that complexity on the margins to let things breathe, right? To let things go. Um, and to, to take it back to the book, that's one of the things that I, I was really, you know, all oh, my bazillion flags here sticking out the side. A lot of the patterns that really resonated with me was it's not just for cloud native. It's not just for standing up a cloud, a cloud infrastructure. These are things that as an enterprise, you should really be thinking about. And like an uh, example, the idea of gradually raising stakes, right? That, that's something where, okay, well, I, I would question most leadership teams on some of our enterprise listeners, staffs, have they ever thought about that idea? Can we gradually increase the stakes to a point where, okay, let's find the threshold and see how comfortable we can get with this chaos to drive the, the innovation that we actually need. So, Penny, do you want me to take that one? Uh, sure, yeah. So, gradually raising the stakes. So, it's, it's very nice of you to say this book is more generally applicable. Um, the book is really, and Penny can correct me if I'm wrong, it's 95% other stuff and then reordered and repackaged yeah. and with a new label stuck on the front. So obviously build automation and containers, these are as old as, as, uh, as computing is. And well, at least not containers, of course, electric containers came somewhat later, but they're old concepts. Uh, virtual machine is an old concept. But when you repackage it all up, you get this beautiful thing called cloud native. Gradually raising the stakes and big bets and hedges and options is really classic uh, strategy uh, formulation and classic strategic execution and there's a famous McKinsey paper that cover this but then to my absolute shock two years ago I found the same framework in a high school strategy textbook um, <laughs> and, and so what we're doing and and so what we're doing what you should always be doing if you're doing something new is testing things out first in the imagination this this costs you no money whatsoever why would you spend five million and two years on something you could fix at a whiteboard with a cup of tea? Now, this is the this is the core of our consulting advice. You don't experience is a good teacher, but she's an expensive teacher. Mm -hmm. Your imagination will get you quite far. Now, from your imagination comes a set of experiments, or at least a, a set of potential experiments, some of which can be tested uh, in real life. These are basically how you raise the stakes. You try something, and then you build a path back, and then you try again. Now. Again, I didn't mean to make change this into a psychology podcast, but when you work in an organization that's not psychologically safe, you do one of two things. You take no risks because it doesn't invite criticism mm -hmm. or you take such huge risks. Nobody could ever fault you because you were so ambitious and you had a <laughs> grand vision. So people deliberately <laughs> avoid people deliberately avoid experimentation because within there is accountability. Why did you spend that? What's the next step? Whereas if you go big and say, we're going to move all of our legacy workloads to Amazon in the next six months, nobody would criticize you. You'd probably get a pay rise for your ambition. Now at Container Solutions, you'd get properly in trouble for being stupid. Uh, <laughs> so this is what gradually raising the stakes is about. And as, a, as I said, the type of workplaces attract a certain type of people that are either fully risk averse or completely reckless. And the space in between is where you succeed. And that space is pretty much unknown to a lot of companies out there. Uh, uh, agreed. And, and, but, and to your point, Jamie, um, there does need to be, you know, I've run into uh, um, a whole ton of agile coaches, consultants, right? Transformation gurus. We're going to change your org. We're going to change your culture, right? Um, there is almost a lack of acknowledgement that there, there are, and I, I just, uh, I think Yuval Harari just talked about this when I just, I just finished reading Sapiens. And he talks about that where, well, you know, with bureaucracy and, you know, here, you know, God, the king is dead long with the king. Some people just want to be told what to do. And that needs to be a tacit acknowledgement, right? You need, to, you need to understand that there is going to be a population inside your organization. You're trying to do this whiz-bang change, right? You're trying to, to, to shift that needle. There are going to be people who will just naturally resist, right? That, like, you know, the, you talked about the, the people who like to follow command and order, right? Command and control and spiral dynamics, the blues, right? Um, some people do like to do that, and that's not necessarily bad, but um, their continued existence in the organization may be incongruent to the greater goals. There's well, no problem. Yeah. Go, go ahead, Pity. Yeah, there, there's no problem with that. Of course, right. you cannot put a person who is risk averse to take risks, right? That's that's like, I mean, it's against their nature. You need to put put right people in the right places. Um, majority of people are expecting to be told what to do, right? and you cannot you cannot change that. You need to understand the nature of people, and you need to understand the people you are working with. As a manager, you learn that. 
there is no single management strategy that works on everyone. It's about figuring out on personal level who can do what most effectively. The real question is how you embed the right behavior in the enterprise culture, in the company culture. Mm -hmm. So what is company culture? And what we're saying in the book is basically culture is, is some of all your behaviors. Right? Instead yeah. of it's in my DNA that you cannot change, but it's more like, you know, it's just a bunch of small behaviors. If you're talking to somebody and you're saying something wrong, will they blame you for, for that? Will they you know, shame you in front of others? Because if, if they do, then you won't do it next time. Right. right. If you encourage taking risks, if you uh, incentivize people for taking risks, then people will do it. So you, it's the real question is how you embed the correct behavior in your day to day work. Right, right, right. And that ties to um, one. And there are a bazillion patterns in this book. I could have you guys on for hours and we could just go through each one. I'm sure we'd have a blast, especially once happy hour tips over and we start drinking beers, it'll get loose. Um, but you, this this ties directly to one of the patterns that I, I actually printed out and stuck up on my wall. The idea of managing for creativity, right? The idea of that funnel, right? Of what you, the, the, I hate, I hate the fact that I quote Donald Rumsfeld, the whole known known versus known unknown versus unknown yeah. unknown, right? And, and, and funneling that type of behavior and that type of activity into something that's more yeah. defined, process-oriented and real. I mean, I saw this and the first thing you think of, well, you think of the triple horizon model, right? I also yes. thought about Jeffrey Moore's zone to win, where when you things move from different zones, you know, it becomes almost a utility, right? Like, like yeah. the internet is now basically a utility, whether our government will acknowledge that it's a different story, but Jamie, you're going to say something. I'll just, I'll just pick up. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think the three horizons model is essential for this. And this is an absolutely critical tool for, uh, for success of, uh, for anything. Right. And, and we are applying this and those patterns, not just in cloud native world, but also, for example, in our marketing team, mm -hmm. the three horizons is about really it's sort of different angle on raising the stakes, gradually raising the stakes. It's very important that you are, you know, the horizon one is, is your current business and horizon two is innovation, horizon two is long-term research. If you didn't do one of them, then you either not making money, right? Or right. will not make money in the future. One of those, right? And what tends to happen is, is one way past, right? We start as a startup, as a small company, you're, by nature, you are innovative and you are doing all kinds of crazy things because otherwise you, you, you have no idea what to do. Mm -hmm. And you become more and more uh, sort of, you, you get the point eventually until you scale to become an enterprise. And then uh, uh, at that point, everything becomes very algorithmic and consistent. Mm -hmm. That is the biggest trap for enterprises. At that point, they lose the capability to innovate. And that's why what we do for our customers all the time is for large enterprise, the most important part is set up, set aside significant portion of time for horizon two and three. Right. And those things need to be managed dramatically different because horizon three, which is innovation, is research and creativity. You cannot tell people, you know, I want three innovations by next month. I mean, <laughs> it, it just doesn't work this right, way. It doesn't work that way. Right, right. No. Um, so that, that's an essential element of innovation is to set aside time for the team and manage that time in very, very uh, open way, without pressure, set the goals, get the general idea and let people be. And enterprise just cannot do that. Because, uh, yeah. You bring up a good point, Penny, when you say that these different horizons need to be managed in different ways. It's not the one yeah. size fits all approach. And that ties to, um, I just had a conversation with uh, Jonathan Rasmussen uh, from his book. You know, he did a lot of time at Spotify and his last book was competing, at, competing with unicorns. And he makes the same remark where he said, if you think, if you remember, every enterprise was a startup at one point. It, everybody was an innovator at any, any successful org was an innovator and in startup at one point. And a lot of what you talk about in this book and a lot of what a lot of people are starting to acknowledge now in the, in the greater IT agile space is we need to rediscover that. Like we talk about rediscovering your inner child. We need to rediscover our inner startup and, and lean on that to innovate us towards success. And the most successful companies like Google, for example, 
they do it systematically. They embed it in their way of working. Mm -hmm. The 20% rule, the internal startups, separate budgets. If you have an idea, they will let you explore. Even if you have an extremely important job to do, they will still take you off and you put, because, you know, eventually you invent Gmail, right? Or something else that is even bigger than just one person job. And uh, majority of enterprises sort of, they just don't have this capability to, to innovate. Or, or in, other, in other places, what we see is this 20% ruling. So you have 20% of time to spend on innovation, but it is managed with extreme agile approach where everything is under high uh -huh. pressure, which is actually doesn't allow creativity to, to thrive. Right. You, you need of course, to... some... Go on, Jamie. Go on. I was, I was going to say, and of course, some people argue that there is a system for innovation, and it's this. Large enterprises squeeze as much profit as they can out of their companies, return that as dividends to shareholders who are private equity firms, who then do startups that the big companies buy back. <laughs> so Some people argue that this system of innovation is the most effective, and it's actually working. I think Jamie's inner cynic is coming out. I definitely need to fly to the UK and have a couple of beers with him and see what comes out of it. We're either going to start uh, the, the next uh, Guy Fawkes revolt, or we're just going to end up having a really great time and a great conversation. But you're right, though. It is kind of, it is cannibalistic in nature, but not cannibalistic in a way that's positive that enables growth. It's kind of, it's kind of backwards and almost backdoor self-serving, right? That it's, well, it's self-dealing. Well well, I mean, you call me a cynic, and I, I don't mind. I've been called worse things than that. But if you if you give an accountant, you give the numbers to my my colleague Christian and my friend in the accounts department, and he will do your calculation on return on invested capital, and he will mathematically prove it's better to not innovate and buy small companies. And that is what a lot of companies do. Mm. Uh, and the problem is, as that model starts to break down, because, for example, Starling Bank here in London, uh, I don't think they're for sale. So they've innovated, nudged their competitors out of the way, but they don't want to be bought. So unfortunately, as the old model breaks down, it does seem that companies seem to, you know, they have to learn how to innovate. Um, unfortunately, the last 50, 50 years, five decades, has really been, business has been about conservation, protecting margins, and having a very narrow focus. Uh, you're uh, that ties to a lot you know a lot, you know we talk a lot about culture and incentive right what people are incentivized to do is the way they actually end up doing things whether they um outright acknowledge it or not um i am convinced that one of the greatest travesties pushed on most major companies is the idea of cost accounting as a driver to do where as a driver of investment right um i i have just I have completely bought into the idea of throughput accounting. I'm a big fan of the Goldratt Institute in theory of constraints. If somebody out there is listening, please call me. I'd love to have you on the show. Um, I, and I watched a, a good friend of mine is at a large scale. I'll give you a perfect example. A good, good friend of mine um, is at a large scale enterprise um, company inside the States. I think they're around, they got to be around 50 or 60,000 people. So no small, not small potatoes. He, and he jokingly told me the other day we were connecting over Zoom to have a beer, just you know, breaking, uh, just uh, uh, breaking bread. And he said, "I literally watched my company lose an entire quarter of productivity worrying about budgeting for the next year, and lining up numbers, and lining up whose team got this funding and that funding." And and he said, "Think about all that time we could have actually been doing something." that our, our shareholders, right, to, to, to Jamie's point, talk about investors, right, and venture capital, they would love, they, I'm sure they would prefer us to spend that money innovating as opposed to figuring out, does Jay have enough money to fund Penny and Jamie for the next year? And if not, is he going to borrow it from Carla or is Carla going to be over as well? You know what I mean? Like, it's kind of, there are some fundamental truths that I think everybody should take a philosophy class and do some soul searching in and then maybe we can evolve, evolve to the right way. So in, in a even weirder way, it's like when they do decide to invest in innovation, what typically an enterprise would do is they put aside 2 million and 50 people or 5 million or any sub random large number, right? And very large group of people and tell them, go and build a new thing. And those initiatives never work because actually, according to the goal theory and all kinds of other theories, right? you just cannot build a successful product from scratch with a large group of people because mm -hmm. you need to give them work right and in the initial stages of innovation there is no work for everyone there's mostly innovation and right. creativity 
and 50 people cannot be equally created. No, and it'll work. It'll work backwards because every every human, most mentally sound human beings, don't want to be a burden and they want to contribute. You throw fifty people together and they'll all want to show that they're creating value and adding yeah. worth. When actually they're probably causing headaches. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and, and especially at large scale, um, and fifty doesn't sound like a lot, but it is a decent amount of people. And you're telling go be inventive, right? And then things things like. Um, Pecking order from the Howard Bloom's work with the Lucifer principle, pecking order starts coming into play, right? You have natural stratification. Yeah. You have people start filling into roles, right? I typically fall into the Joker role. I don't really contribute, but I keep everybody loose and laughing. Um, I'll probably just overshare it and ruin some future career prospects there. But you're right. You can't force um, force creativity and inventiveness in a group by, by, um, by tacit uh, explanation and expectation and then just expect it to work. It's just not going to work that way. Uh, the, the other no. thing we have we have to talk about values because because if you look at cloud natives who are value prism it values collaboration and it values experimentation sometimes for experimentation's sake which is another way way of saying it values playfulness some people don't value creativity values are what make a politician uh, talk against his best interests or her best interests values are what makes a child return a wallet to somebody even though nobody saw them drop it you cannot turn up and say to people, we now have to do something creative and collaborative, collaboratively. As soon as you go up against the value system, you will fight tooth and claw for it. Exactly as we've seen in the United States in the last few years. Mm-hmm. The values of democracy were threatened and oh my God, did people want to fight back for that. And ultimately, this is the source of a lot of failure with cloud native and with innovation in general. People, many people simply don't value what innovation what innovation requires. That's not a value judgment. It doesn't mean they're better than us or worse than us. It simply means you'll no more make uh, uh, somebody who doesn't value creative creative. And no matter what you do, no matter what training you give Mm -hmm. them or how how many, you know, exercises you give them at the whiteboard, it just won't work. Right. Right. Perfect. Um, and you know what? I think that I couldn't pick a better quote to end on if I tried. So Jamie, thank you for that one. You made, you made my life easier. The end, the end mark arcs are always a little bit difficult. Um, so uh, again, I've had you guys on for quite a while. I know we could go for quite a while more. Um, if listeners want to find you, they want more information about either the both of you. Um, obviously we're going to have a link to your website. We'll put a link to the book. We'll have links to all sorts of stuff. If they have questions, they want to reach out, maybe learn a little more. Where do they go? There are easy ways to find us, which is uh, on Twitter or LinkedIn. But I think the most interesting place to look for is WTF Cloud Native. That's where we're trying to answer all the questions. That's uh, everything we write, create, or discuss is now going under under that uh, overall umbrella of, uh, of storytelling. Perfect. Jamie, anything to add to that? No, not at all. So WTF Cloud Native is the best thing to subscribe to. You could always follow both of us on Twitter. I can tell you, your listeners right now, my Twitter feed is, includes my hatred of the conservative government, rugby league, and Cloud Native. And that's it. I exclusively stick to those three things. Uh, but at least a third of it's Cloud Native. It, it, it's true. Twitter has become one of those weird places where it, it really Ooh, is I like to record that bit again. Hello. Hello. No, 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 no. We got you, Jamie. We got you. You, you never know what you're going to get when you fi- sign into Twitter these days. It's kind of like the Sorry. most insane digital market. So, um, uh, first of all, I, on behalf of myself and our listeners, I want to thank you, Jamie. I want to thank you, Penny. I want to thank Carla. Um, you're wonderful, uh, uh, wonderful PR person who helped me set all this up. I want to thank all of you on behalf of all of us. I want to thank the listeners for tuning in again. Uh, if you enjoyed our episode, please give us a review, uh, a rating, leave comments, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher. It's on Audible. It's everywhere uh, on your podcast platform of choice. It really does help people find us. Uh, if you liked the conversation and you want to hop in more, we have a very, very vibrant Discord server. Uh, we had a conversation this morning going on about, um, I believe it was some sort of cloud technology, and then it dovetailed into The Fifth Element, the movie by Luke Besson back in the 90s, and how uh, amazing... Um, <laughs> Mili Jovovich's uh, um, acting was. So uh, if you're interested, find us on our Discord server. I'll have links in the show notes. And as always, our shows are free. They will continue to be free. All of our content is free. However, we do have a Patreon. If you really like what you hear and you want to contribute, you will more than likely get a surprise in the mail from me and maybe some funny stickers or whatnot. Uh, so once again, on behalf of myself, I want to thank Jamie and Penny. On behalf of Jamie, Penny, and myself, and Carla, I want to thank all of you listeners for tuning in. And until next time, this is the Agile Uprising Podcast signing out.